Good morning. The Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriation and Housing convenes this budget hearing. The budget hearing notice were given to the media on Wednesday, July 3rd. Second notice was on July 9th. And for the record, today is July 12th, 2019. It's now 9 o'clock. The budget hearing is called to order. This budget hearing is, um, we'll hear, the committee will hear and accept testimonies both oral and written on the following. The fiscal year budget of the Mayor's Council of Guam. Joining me for this public hearing is um, the Oversight Chair, Senator uh, Jose Piru Terlai, and Senator uh, Will Castro, and to my right is Senator um, Therese Terlai. The conduct of this public hearing will be, will be a, shall be as follows. Those testifying will be recognized in the order. We will start with the Mayor's Council first. Uh, written testimony may be read. Lending testimony should be summarized. Written testimony sh shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide our legislature staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony shall be confined to the substance. We're talking about the budget, so let's talk about the budget. Persons will be allowed to, to present oral testimony. Once you're done, you may be asked to remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony. I'd like to also recognize additional colleagues that have joined us, uh, Speaker Tina Munoz barnes and Senator Tello Tidewey. Proper form and decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form and decorum may be restricted from providing oral testimony or any additional oral testimony and may be asked to leave or be escorted and removed from the room. Fair warning, if proper form and decorum is not provided or practiced, you will be escorted out. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. And please state your name. We will now begin to hear testimonies on fiscal year 2020 budget, the Mayor's Council of Guam. We have today, we have um, the President of the Mayor's Council, Mayor from the great village of Dededu, Mayor Melissa Savaris, which is my hometown. And we have the, uh, the director. Okay. Is uh, Director Angel Sablon. And also that joined us is uh, Senator Regina Lee Bisco Lee. And we also have present to testify, public input would be Mr. Barry Mead. But we will now begin with the presentation with the president and then uh, whoever she, she desires to speak on behalf of the mayor's council. Ma'am. Hi, good morning, um, uh, Senator San Augustine. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm here with our executive director this morning. Manana uh, Sizuas to all of you. Uh, I'll go ahead and yield to our executive director as he represents the entire body. Thank you. Executive director, Mr. Sablon. Manana Sizus. Honorable Gehelo Sinodot, <clears throat> Joe S. and Augustine. Honorable Gehelo Sinodot, Jose Pedro Terlahi, Senadora Telotairegui, Senadora Therese Terlahi. Senator William Castro and Gov Gehilo, Speaker Tina Munya Barnes and Senator Senator Regina Piscoli. Manana Sizus, at the outset of my budget testimony and justification today, I want to reiterate that the Mayor's Council of Guam is fully appreciative of the support you have given us and of the suggestions you have also offered in providing more services to our communities. You know what the mayors do, and you know what they need to get it done. When it really comes down to it, all of you have always been receptive and attentive to the needs of our villages, and always try to heed the call of our mayors and vice mayors. We thank all of you for your support and assistance for us, even if it was not a popular thing to do. We fully understand that all of us in the government must try to be resourceful with what we have. Our budget as presented today will be straightforward plain and simple. Our budget appropriation for FY19 was 
$159. For FY20, we are asking for $13,827,904, an increase of $1,254,745. The biggest item on our budget, as with all other budget requests in the government, is for personnel. The 19 villages will comprise of 214 unclassified employees, inclusive of the 19 mayors and seven vice mayors. The central office staff will have a total of one unclassified and 10 classified employees. There are eight villages that have gyms and are allocated three additional full-time employees above the five that are allocated to every village. The total amount for payroll salaries is $7,195,576 and $2,688,857 in benefits. The other big ticket item we are requesting is an appropriation of $240,000 for the repair and renovation of our 12 senior centers at $20,000 per center. There are roof leaks in the Tamuning Senior Center, the Agate Senior Center, the Jigo Senior Center, and the Inarohan Senior Center. There are pr plumbing problems in the Machanao Community Dementia Center, and the Estumbo Senior Center. There are air con problems in the Aganya Heights Senior Center, the Mauricio Senior Center, and the Santa Rita Senior Center. The longer we do not attend to this matter of our centers, the more costly it will be to fix them. We look for any unused funds in our current budget to take care of the problems like leaks, air conditioning failures, broken tables and chairs, etc. Again, this is something we either appropriate for now or face the consequences of higher repair costs in the not too distant future. While we anticipate that there will be assistance from the Office of the Governor through compact impact funds, we still need to stress that we cannot afford to withhold on these repairs. A status quo request of 70,000 for daily operations of the Mayor's Council Administration Office, 35,000 for supply and materials, and 35,000 for contractual service for office equipment maintenance internet service, printing services, and vehicle maintenance. There are 19 district offices, 13 community centers, eight gymnasiums, 12 senior centers, three dementia centers, and a multitude of recreational facilities, basketball, baseball, softball, football, and a number of park facilities under the jurisdiction of the mayor's council or the village mayors. A request of 708,330 for power, 224,510 for water, 67,935 for telephone, totals $1,775,000 for utilities, which is actually 98,425 lower than the FY19 authorized level. We do not anticipate to expend all these funds, especially in power, as we have already begun to change out many of our incandescent light bulbs to low voltage LED bulbs and have started replacing our inefficient sodium recreation field lights with LED as well. All these facilities are in use daily for the many sports programs that are sponsored by the mayor's offices or coordinated by various leagues around the island. As for water usage, we do have various months where we see a spike in consumption, and these we attribute to the undetected water leaks, medical car wash fundraisers, or used by residents that have no water, running water in their place of residence and find the closest place to obtain water is at a mayor's office or recreational field. While we are aware that this is happening, we are also cognizant of the fact that those with children need water for bathing, cooking, and plain simple hygiene. While we realize these actions add up to the cost of utilities, you would never find a mayor or a vice mayor who would turn their back on those that truly need it. The Mayor's Council has been looking for available government building space to house the MCOG central office. And we were given hope that it could be a reality by utilizing space at the governor's complex. It is just not feasible nor justifiable after a tour of the facilities. It may have saved our central office from rental expense, but all we would have done is place that burden on another government agency to pay for their space as it would have been required them to move out of the governor's complex. While we have not been successful in finding suitable space for our central office, we are still looking at other government unused space. 
This year, every mayor's office is operated out of its own government facility. The mayor of Inarahan transferred her office space to the newly renovated youth center, which was underutilized. The only space rental fees for FY20 is $61,965, an increase of $4,131 from this fiscal year. Due to an increase of our office space rental in July 2020 to September 2020, from $4,819 dollars and fifty cents to six thousand one hundred ninety six dollars and fifty cents this rental agreement was done through gsa and doa we will continue to do our due diligence to obtain a functional government office space for the central office of the mayor's council the current allotted amount of twenty thousand for the president's contingency fund is again requested for fy20 the president and officers of the council use this fund to host visiting official guests and sponsor worthwhile community events. This year alone, the council has already hosted numerous mayors and vice mayors and elected councilmen from our sister cities. And quite a few of them will be here to help celebrate our 75th festivities and Guam Island Fair. The current allotted amount of 20,000 for the Association of Mariana Island Mayors, Vice Mayors and elected council members is also requested for FY20. The association was established for the purpose of enhancing, promoting, and preserving the cultural traditions and heritage of the Mariana Islands people, and to establish mutual cooperation, our public harmony, and general prosperity among our local municipal governments and leaders. The requested amount is to support our mayors and vice mayors' participation in the association's annual general assembly, executive and committee meetings, and membership dues for all 26 members. The districts do not submit individual budgets for the operation of their village functions, but are distributed by the Mayor's Council of Guam based on the levels of appropriation approved by this body. The Streets Maintenance and Beautification, SMB, funding of $932,423 as approved in FY19 is being requested an increase of $100,000 to bring it back to its FY18 level. The amount is divided among the villages pro rata based on the 2007 Guam Roads and Pavement Inventory by the Department of Public Works after an initial allocation of 20,000, which is determined by this body and made a part of the budget bill. The District of Dededo gets the biggest share, while the District of Imatic gets the smallest share. This funding is issued by the mayor's offices for their office operations, supplies, contractual services, as well as for street maintenance and beautification. Please be cognizant, however, that these funds are only used for secondary and tertiary roads and not on routed highways that some people think these funds were allotted for. We are fully aware that the village all vary in land size. Jigo is the biggest at 35.41 square miles, followed by Dededo with 30.56 square miles, Jonia with 20.28 square miles, and Little Low in Arahan but it has 18.85 square miles. In Arahan, in fact, is much larger than the more populated village of Temuning, Manila, or Barigada. And the one-size-fits-all distribution of funds do not, does not seem fair or justifiable to the larger and more populated villages of Derido, Jigo, Temuning, and Manila, or the bigger land area villages like Jonia and in Arahan. This has been a bone of contention and area of debate for many years, and to date has not been proper, properly addressed or resolved. In fact, why do we continue to use a roads pavement inventory by the Department of Public Works, which is already 12 years behind the times? The Public Safety and Social Education Program, PSSEP, funding of 416000 860, as approved in FY18, is again requested for FY20. An equal amount of $21,940 is allocated to each of the 19 districts to support programs that reduce underage drinking, support traffic safety, reduce drug-related violence and abuse, and to support organized sports programs and substance abuse prevention programs. This equal distribution is a mandate of many previous legislatures. These funds are expended in accordance with plans approved by each municipal planning council. Every village conducts numerous programs that benefit their residents and have helped 
many that have gone astray or might have gone astray. These funds, I stress, are not for main highways or routed roads. Deaths on our highways is not the result of these funds not being expended for those roads. That is strictly a federal highway and DPW funding issue and responsibility. The Island-Wide Village Beautification Projects funding, IWVBP, funding of $470,921 as approved in FY18 is also requested for FY20. An equal amount of 24,785 is allocated to each of the 19 districts. These funds are used for maintenance and repair of recreational facilities and for beautifying these facilities. The village's main roads are maintained and repaired through these funds as well. The mayors and vice mayors have always seemed to be outsmarted by illegal trash dump dumpers and dumping. While the mayors always try to plant trees and flowers, there are those in the villages that are content to just plant trash and junk along the roads. Additionally, the mayor's offices still deal with graffiti and destroying government facilities rather than being content with having well-maintained and useful facilities. We are requesting for the Ground Maintenance for Schools GMS program a funding of $481,957 back to the funding level of 2018 and that it continue to be appropriated to the Mayor's Council of Guam Revolving Fund. We request some amendments to the mandate of the appropriation by allowing the addition of the following criteria. A lump sum appropriation be made in order to allow the Mayor's Council to increase, decrease, or remain as is the levels of appropriation in FY 18 and 19 based on a new formula or update survey of each school to adequately determine grass cutting areas which will be provided by GDOE. Allow the ability for duly permitted and registered nonprofit school organizations or PTOs to have first chance at contracting with MCOG to cut and maintain grass areas in their respective schools. This will allow the school organization an opportunity to raise funds for their organizations and display pride in their own work and responsibility provided their cost for services does not exceed any licensed small business who submits a quote for services or the total amount allotted for such school. Three, allow other duly permitted and registered NGOs or nonprofit organizations to contract with the Mayor's Council to provide grass cutting services in various schools, provided their cost does not exceed any licensed small business who submits a quote for services or total amount allotted for the school. Mayors should continue to have the flexibility to use their own personnel, purchase grass cutting equipment, fuel, and parts as well. There is no backlog of payment to the vendors as it is from the Mayor's Council of Guam revolving account. The Limited Gaming Fund, LGF, though not a part of our FY20 budget submittal, is deliberately left that way as it is this body that will determine the 33% of the available funds collected in FY19 that will be made a part of the Mayor's Council of FY20 budget. As you are aware, these funds can only be used for the purposes set forth in Public Law 34-42, Section 2. The FY19 appropriation of $524,913 dollars was equally distributed to each district in FY19 in the amount of $27,627. The EPA Recycling Revolving Fund, appropriated in FY18, is also not a part of our FY20 budget request. The FY18 appropriation of $2,181,296 from GEPA was used to enhance and implement Guam's recycling program and efforts. We are appreciative of the appropriation to deal with the removal and processing of abandoned vehicles, white goods, electronics, tires, and greenways, and have seen positive results in all our villages. The unencumbered and or deobligated amount for FY18 totaling $1,360,962.99 have been carried over in FY19 for continued use of the Mayor's Council 
of which the entire amount is close to being encumbered to continue with our island-wide cleanup program. We request that an appropriation for FY20 of $2,181,296 be made to the Mayor's Council so that this program can continue unabated and with consistency. The Guam EPA and the Mayor's Council have a memorandum of understanding and an approved island-wide environmental cleanup program in place and in effect to the end of FY 2020. The host community fund for the villages of Orla and Iran is also not included in our FY 20 submission. The annual amount of 300,150 for each of the two villages is an item at the discretion of Lihes Latour and Guahan to include in the FY 20 MCOG budget. I can assure you that both villages look forward to this appropriation as they have embarked on great plans to enhance the communities with the addition of community centers and gyms. These funds are under the sole jurisdiction of the village mayor and its municipal planning council. The Liberation Memorial Fund of 35,000 was appropriated in FY18 for use by the Mayor's Council to fund its 2018 Liberation Memorial events. We believe it is important to continue to appropriate funds for this integral part of our liberation festivities. This year, it is being funded by the proceeds of the 2019 Queen's ticket sales. While we have not expended any government funds, we believe we can better plan ahead for next year's memorials, of which we are certain more will be added. For this year's liberation memorials, the Liberation Committee is expending $3,000 for each of the memorials, of which there are 13 so far, with one being commemorated as we speak in Manila. We do request your support in the FY20 budget appropriation in the amount of 39000 to cover for the 13 memorials already earmarked as part of our liberation commemorations. Senators, this is our FY20 MCOG budget, simple and straightforward. We have been criticized and castigated because our funding comes more from the Territorial Highway Fund and the Tourist Attraction Fund rather than the General Fund. This is not of our making, nor have we ever requested that it be this way. I humbly ask you that you assist us and correct this so we are not continuously thrown under the bus for appropriation sources we have never asked to be a part of. And in the spirit of accountability and transparency, I would also like to apprise this body of other funds under our purview that are not appropriated into the MCOG budget. The Senior Center Operations, total grants we've received for thus far is 628000 $419.18. This is for the operation of our 12 senior centers. There are 19 unclassified employees. And this program, we have been asked to continue until the end of September 30, 2020. The adult daycare operations, the dementia facility in Wustik, Dededo, and in the Macheche Community Center, and the Inarahan ADC Center. Total grants from public health for this program is $876,714.77. Number of employees, 35 unlimited employees. I'm sorry, 35 limited term employees. And the program end date, we have also been asked to continue until September 30, 2020. The in-home services program and the case management services program, which we used to run, has, has ended. The in-home ended on March 31st of this year, and the case management services ended on April 30th of this year are, and are now under a private contractor, I believe it's Health Professionals of the Pacific. Additionally, we ask that the following miscellaneous provision be again added to our FY20 budget bill. We request for a provision in the FY20 Budget Act to allow the Mayor's Council of Guam to carry over all unexpended lapse funds for use in any category except personnel in FY20. One, continuing appropriation to the Mayor's Council of Guam. The unexpended balance of funds appropriated to the Mayor's Council for FY19 shall not lapse and is available to the Mayor's Council for expenditures in FY20. 
to the authority to make payments on prior year obligations. Notwithstanding any other provisions of the law, the Mayor's Council of Guam is hereby authorized to utilize unexpended funds appropriated to the MCOG for FY19 and funds appropriated for FY19 to be expended to pay for prior year, year's obligation incurred. This is in essence our budget and available funds in our purview. The Mayor's Council of Guam has always been cooperative in keeping expenses and costs at a minimum. We are confident, however, that you will support our request so that the Mayor's Council of Guam can continue to do the good that it always strives to do for our residents. And now that I have asked for money, please allow me to offer ideas on how we can save or make money. Number one, our user's fee schedule has gone through many years of inaction, even after multiple submission to various legislatures. We asked that our submission of April 18, 2008, and resubmitted on June 6, 2018, two years ago, be accepted and deemed duly vetted through the AAA process. The uniform usage fees for all districts will allow mayors to properly charge for facility usage, equipment usage, and facility rental that can go towards maintenance and repair costs instead of annually asking for an appropriation. Two, while we have good relations with our autonomous agencies, it is, is it an unheard of request to ask that statute be proposed to ensure that the Mayor's Council of Guam be the agency of first choice to donate used vehicles and equipment whenever they rotate out their inventory? While we do, not, while we do need new vehicles, we have not asked for any appropriation since 2016, because we truly believe there are enough used and usable vehicles in the government's inventory that can best be utilized by our villages instead of just being auctioned off. Three, as you pass by GSA and PD, I am sure you can see the many vehicles, vans, trucks, and the like parked in their lot. We are willing to pay to get those vehicles. The problem is, we are usually at the bottom of the totem pole before we are asked to obtain such vehicles or equipment. Can a higher ranking be legislated for the MCOG? Four, can we mandate that responsible parties and their insurance carriers be held responsible for repair and or replacement and payments made thereof of damages done to any facilities, streetlight poles, guardrails, etc., in our villages and throughout the island. These funds will offset any funds that our offices have to come up with to correct someone else's wrong or mistake. Payments should be made to the affected villages' non appropriated funds. Five, the Jigo Mayor's Office has already obtained dedicated land to build a new Mayor's Office. The current one is dilapidated, and if you remember, those of you who are old enough, perhaps one of you is, that building was built to be a dispensary. Jigo has since grown by hoops and bounds and is still growing. Please help them set aside some capital outlay money to make this request a reality. Six, recently the Guam Economic Development Authority met with the Mayor's Council of Guam and presented its Opportunity Zones, OZ, concept that identifies areas in our different villages where there is available government land for job opportunities, business opportunities, tourism opportunities, etc., for our residents. The only setback is we believe current statute allows for only a five-year lease term for our government properties. And this is not conducive for any kind of long-term investment. We are looking for any of you to champion this cause and seek an amendment to the statute to allow for a longer lease term period of 25 years or more. I am sure Gita will support this cause if any of you would introduce it. Seven. 
Recently, we met with the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, to talk about feral animals, namely wild pigs. These pigs have been causing havoc in many of our villages, so much so that they nonchalantly walk into people's yards or take refuge in bus stops. The USDA has a program of providing funds to entities on a cost-sharing basis. Whatever, whatever funds an entity can come up with, USDA is willing to double the amount. This can be a win-win situation for MCOG as well as the Department of Agriculture. Let's say we provide 10,000 and get an additional 20,000 to purchase traps to remove these wild pigs. It takes an appropriation though, and we hope you give it serious consideration. Eight, FEMA has granted approval to the MCOG to obtain funding, again, on a cost-sharing basis to repair, refurbish, and replace damages made by typhoon winds on September 10 and 11 of last year in the amount of $265,299.69. The federal share is 75%, which is $198,974, dollars and 77 cents. The non-federal share of 25 percent is 66,324 dollars and 92 cents. And this is the amount needed to be appropriated by this body in order for the MCOG to obtain FEMA funding for Barragada, Chalampago Ordered, Hagatnya, Mangilao, Mongmung Toto Maiti, Santa Rita, Sinahanya, Tamuning, Yamatic, and Jigo. In addition, insur insurance coverage for all these replacements and or repairs in the amount of $84,453.14 must be obtained before final payment is made. We need your support on this. The window of opportunity will end six months from April 29, 2019. And while that may be in September of this year, we have been told that we can request for an extension. M Mr. Sablon, before you go on, uh -huh. who, ha who have you submitted that request for funding from to relate to the FEMA? I just wanted to ask that simple question. We have some it ends six months from April 2019. Actually, it's, it's not a grant. These are based on the damages received by our villages for their facilities. Un understood. I'm just reading what, what you wrote. It's For my colleagues, it's number eight or page 10. I wrote, I wrote the page number, but... It says FEMA has granted approval to MCOG to obtain funding again, right? Yes. I'm just reading what you yes. wrote, okay? Yeah. And at the very bottom, we need your support on this. The window of opportunity will end six months from April, May, June, July. It's July. It's three months already. Three months left. I'm just asking this very simple question. Who? We have not. You have not submitted no, have a request? Not. No, we have not. Okay. I, I'm, when did you just get this information? Last month. Last month, but they yeah, said it, and it's it expires not, April. It was not in time to put into our FY20 budget okay, request. So I'm, I'm going to safely say that you're going to give that to your oversight chair, right? So that we can entertain He's already that. said he will support well, I, this I, request. I, I need the And we, we the actually bill. included, attached the, uh, the documents from FEMA okay. in your packet there. Okay. Okay, then it thank you. It shows the breakdown of every village and what they will be obtaining. Okay. Thank you. And the insurance portion... They will, they will not repair the facility or provide any assistance if we do not obtain insurance for it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, number nine, aside from all the programs and maintenance work done by our mayor's offices, there is also another aspect that takes up a lot of time, manpower, and funds, especially in the huge districts of Dededo, Jigo, Mangilao, and Tamuning. We may get flack for this, but it's something pro worthwhile proposing. I am talking about mayor's verification forms that need to be completed at the resident's request. Almost every other agency and branch of the government charges fees for this type of service. Driver's license, police clearance, birth and death certificates, marriage certificates, court clearances, 
In fact, we just seen the other day that the court clearance fees are going up to $30. And, list, and the list goes on. Mayor's verification is also expensive. We need to charge a fee. Maybe the first request can be free. But any subsequent request for the same verification should come at a price and should only be good for 30 days, just like police and court clearances. We say 30 days because when the digital mayor gives the verification, those residents can move in the next two weeks to another village and they'll still claim that they're still residents of Dededo because nobody changes the verification. When they go in for their SNAP, they go in for their driver's license, they go in for their real ID. And so that's the reason for that. The MCOG needs to recover its cost for this service and all funds collected should go to each village. Now for the maintenance of their computers, copier machines, and replenishment of supplies. If any of you have gone to the Dededo Mayor's Office, it's like Grand Central Station in the morning. There are people lined up and seated outside just waiting to get verification from. I'm sure the Mayor can attest to that. And some of these people come back in a week's time, two or three times, because they get it, they lose it, they get it, they lose it, and we continue to provide it to them. So there should be, mm -hmm. if any one of you would like to proffer uh, this legislation. Okay, Mr. Sablon, in reference to that, the, the mayor's verification, how does that impact the election? And the reason why I ask that question is because if Dededu, the Dededu mayor gives a verification, but then tomorrow is election, the person is voting somewhere else, but he's getting the verification. I'm trying to understand how does that relate because, you know, like some people say you got a, was that uh, all of a sudden an arrival of more residents to vote in that village? And I'm just trying, I need to understand how is that, how is your verification being matched up with the election commission on who lives where? And how are they registered in Dededu and really they're voting in Tumuning or Jigo? And, and, and that concerns everybody because uh, everyone that runs for office, especially the mayors, they want to know who's their resident, who they're servicing. And if you live there, then in that village, you should be serviced by that mayor, but if you're not registered, how do you do a verification on where they live? Yeah. I'm just curious. The, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, what ha Election Commission has done this year is in or they have election process registration uh, ongoing at all the village mayor's offices. Uh, most of our staff are, if not all, are uh, registered registrars. And now they're emphasizing on the um, on the resident, the registered voter, being a resident of that said village. And an example is, Umatic has 700 or 800 voters. There's only 300 people that live in Umatic, so they have more registered voters than they do actually living in the village. And I understand where you're coming from how we verify that they actually physically live in the village, not with 45,000 people. We use lease agreements, utility bills, um, and the utility bills is power, water, or solid waste, because a telephone bill will not tell you where they live, physically live. So those are how, in the larger villages, how we verify that this is your physical address if we don't physically go out there. And it's the same way with Chamorro Land Trust properties. We, they must physically live. They have a Chamorro Land Trust lease. You, if you're living there, you must have water and power. In some cases, they're living there without power and water. So we take their lease. We actually physically go out and verify that they're living in a tent with uh, tunkies lined up. Okay. Mr. So that's Chair. how we verify those. Uh, now, relating it to the voter registration, uh, we do tell residents, you know, voter registration list is done at Election Commission through our, you know, our registration. Many people have been ve registered voters even before they became registered residents of the village. Uh, in League One Terrace, we have many residents never needed a verification for to get into public school system, driver's license until now. 
um, or any of those services. But now that drivers, you know, DMV is requiring it uh, um, to get a Guam ID, it's required. And many of the services are required to have a verification of residence. We are asking them to bring their utility bills. So to tie it in with what you mentioned about voter registration list and those that are registered, we are actually connecting that. We've been doing that for the past year. Okay. Oversight Chair, Joe, you, you, uh, Senator, you have a thank question? You, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since we're on the election process, and I know this is a budget hearing, but let me just say this, that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to the uh, director of uh, the election commission, and there's a new law that came in. So if you're, even if you have been voting in, in for example, in Iran or Marizo, if you have been voting there for the last so many years, and you're now residing in Dededo, you have to register under Dededo. That's the new law, okay? And there's some issues that I'm concerned that was brought, uh, uh, you know, by several, several uh, citizens uh, regarding the election because what is being recommended also is to change that law. And you, if you're originally from Iran, for example, and by marriage you move up to Dededo, and uh, you still want to maintain your voting rights down in, in Rahan, then that's one of the concerns that was brought up. But the exist, existing law right now is that if you move to another village, you have to register uh, in that village. And even if you're voting in Iran, for example, for the last 10, 20 years, if you reside in Dedido, you have to uh, vote in Dedido. Okay, thank you. Mr. Saban, please continue, because you only got one more paragraph, I know yeah. that. Well, and then just before be that paragraph, because I mentioned FEMA earlier, one of the items that I would like also considered by this body is, when I sit up at the EOC with other mayors, and we see the reimbursements being made to GovGuam agencies like GPD, GMH, GPA, and it's reimbursements for hazardous pay. And I began to wonder, I said, our people are the last ones to secure on any storm, even before GPA, even before GPD, even before these other entities, before DPW, but yet they are not entitled to get hazardous pay. And FEMA has told us that if this is in statute, that workers in the storm for MCOG are allowed to receive hazardous pay, they will also pay for that. But currently, as if in the past and all these other payments, our workers have always just gotten a reimbursement of what their regular pay is and over time, but no hazardous pay. So if they are included, at least to receive hazardous pay in times of emergency during storms, FEMA is more than happy to reimburse the government of Guam for payments made to them. But at this time, even though they want to, they can't because we are not listed as one of those workers that are eligible for the hazardous pay. Then that should be a cue for you. That's for a cue for my to, oversight yes. chair. Because that's something that I, I, I know for a fact, the dead do mayor's office, I mean all the mayors, you're the first one out and you're the last one in. That's correct. I know that for a fact. I haven't seen one mayor here is not the first one out to help people during, prior to the storm and after the storm. You're the last one in to actually go home and relax. And uh, you know, thank you for so that. So I will send that to our oversight okay. chair. Okay. And then lastly, but not the least, and this is actually neither here nor there, it's just a suggestion. We offered this suggestion actually some three years ago and we would still like to see it come to fruition. There are 19 main villages on Guam, but in reality, there are more. If you want to count like Tuman, Maina, Totu, Maiti, we are asked talking about the 21 departure gates at the airport. Each one of them could be named after a village. It might give TSA a headache, but sincerely, this is a way to have our visitors learn even more about our villages before they depart our island. It should not cost too much money. It just adds pride to our residents whose village will be featured at a gate. 
now we can't name the gate after a village due to FAA regulations, then we can still have each gate display a village and change gates a few times every quarter. Just a thought and a way to promote our people and our culture. Undankulna Sizus Masi for your support, sincerity. Myself, Angel Sublan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sublan. And I think on the on the issue of the airport, I think there's just a coordination. You can work out the airport because they can say gate one, did it do way, gate 19 or whatever, Yomatic way, whatever. That, that shouldn't be a re that hard. Gate numbers will always stay the same, the numbers. Right. But you know, like you know, like I said, like the gateway to Santa Rita is gate eight. You know, and so so be it. Go that to shouldn't Humata. be too hard, or Yomatic. But but that's something that. You it's should be thought. able to reach out to Senator Tom Ada to work that. I will start the questioning first from the Oversight Chair, Senator Terlai. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You know you're my favorite too, so listen to what I have to say. You know, I, I, I think it's only legit that I, that I mention this because when I was mayor for at least 12 years, we run into obstacles that uh, that are not funded. And you know, thinking about that, there's so many things that I'm looking on this paper that, that you know, involve a, a whole lot of services and a low, whole lot of expense. And I, let me just say that the bulk of the work that we have on this island is centered around the villages. And that's why I support, I support this budget. But let me just say this, that with all the things that you guys do that are not recorded, like putting up canopies for, for, uh, uh, for a meeting, putting up canopies for a get-together, putting up canopies for multi. Some of those, or many of those, are not funded. So I want to ask the, uh, the, uh, the chair, chairman for this budget. Uh, and sir, Mr. Chairman, is there any way talking about the expenses that is not even recorded and is not even budgeted? Can we trustfully turn this budget request into a discretionary budget so that we can be more flexible? Because let me just say this, that, you know, in the past, and when I was mayor for 12 years, and I go to the legislature because I, I represent the mayor's council with the legislative, uh, in the legislative process, we always come out and ask for cash advance. And we do that simply because um, we don't have any cap to all list that is requested on our budget. And the only reason why we, we uh, and not only cash advance, but carry over budget. And the only reason why we want that, uh, that uh, carry over budget to be approved under the budget, bu budget law is that you know, we need heavy equipment. So what we do, what I do when I was mayor, is I save the, some of the previous budget allotment to carry on to the, uh, to the existing budget for that year. That would give me more money to buy heavier equipment. Because we do the stretch of roads that we have, not only the, uh, the number roads, but also the, the village roads. You know, we do all that. And the stretch of roads, especially in Dededo, and I argued this, especially in Dededo and Jigu, Manila, you know, you need those heavy equipments. And, you know, like the cash advance. And I was talking to my, uh, to my bill writer this morning. I said, you know what I want to give the mayor's council? I want to give the mayor's council cash advance because we were talking about preparation for incoming uh, typhoon or things like that. You know, it takes so many days to process a purchase order to go to GSA and, and ask for raincoats, boots, and protective equipments for our employees. So if we allow that cash advance, maybe we can put aside and open up an account with the bank and maybe like five, at the most, $5,000. And not only the mayor's council, even DPW and even civil defense. They need that cash advance authority because of the advanced preparation for, for uh, uh, 
emergency, for example, and uh, incoming typhoon, uh, and that that is one of the reasons. And um, also, you know, uh, you know, when we go and in, uh, into a not an emergency mode. But when we go into uh, preparation for, for an emergency, we, uh, especially a typhoon, uh, maybe tropical storm condition two, tropical storm condition three, and things like that. And I know this because I used to work for civil defense. As long, you know, we stay, we, we get our people to stand by in our office for days. But guess what? We don't give them overtime. I've never experienced giving any overtime to my employees because of preparation. The only time they can, we can allow them to get overtime is when we have a declaration, most, most likely under a president, presidential declaration. But I've never experienced a local you know, a governor doing a, a, a declaration and then we give our employees overtime. It has to be federal uh, declaration. So this is what, and I will be talking to the president of the council and, and, uh, and uh, director regarding some of the plans that I have for the mayor's council because I really do want the, uh, the cash advance and the carryover budget. In, in, and and that is to make sure that on the carryover budget, like what I did when I was mayor, I saved previous year to combine that previous year budget with the exist, existing year so I can buy heavier equipment. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Trelay. Senator Lee. This is Masi, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Mr. Sablan and um, Mayor, for joining us this morning, and thank you for that very thorough uh, presentation on your budget. Um, three things kind of stood out to me. So the first one was the executive director uh, request for $20,000 additional, so we're going from 76149 to 98937. Is that correct? Um, requests for $1,000 increases in appropriations for the following funds. Street maintenance and beautification, island-wide village beautification pro projects, and public safety and social education programs. And then the last one was the uh, request for a $65,000 increase in appropriation for ground maintenance for schools. And I think you've done a good job of identifying um, all the different items that are under those programs, all the different services that the mayors provide. Um, one of the questions that I had is with regard to remaining balances. So the Mayor's Council of Guam is requesting for a $1,032,423 appropriation for streets maintenance and beautification. However, in fiscal year 2018, the Mayor's Council had a remaining balance of 330. $980 for SMB with an allotted amount of $1,036,026. So my question to you is, where did that remaining balance go? Where did that remaining $300,000 go? And then why does the Mayor's Council need a million plus in appropriations when it clearly did not expend that money in FY18. Maybe there's something I'm missing here, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to. Yes, Senator, the, the amounts we actually are requesting now is to bring it back to that level in FY18. As you're aware, in FY19, those funds were all reduced. And in fact, just three days ago, we were asked to further reduce those funds uh, because the TEFF is not receiving uh, the funds as projected, so we're being asked to reduce the, gra the, gr the uh, grounds maintenance fund, and we're asking to reduce the SMB, the street maintenance fund. Now, you asked, we had uh, funds uh, unused in FY18. 
every year I try to explain that just because the mayors have these funds, they don't just go out and just keep spending until they, want, they finish their budget. What they try to do is save money, so like, and I'm sure uh, Senator Pito knows this, save money for the next fiscal year so that $50,000 tractor that they really want to purchase, that they will be able to purchase it in the next year because they couldn't do it this, this year because of the uh, procurement restrictions. Now, if they take all those funds and the mayors put their monies together, then they can go out and get the bigger equipment, put it out on a bid, and get the bigger equipment. So that's why you see those uh, unencumbered funds. It's not because they don't want to use it. They want to use it. But because of the restrictions of procurement, they rather carry it over to the next year. And that's what's been happening every year, is that we have a carryover every year. We've been looking to purchase uh, dump trucks, for example, and backhoes. We almost made it one year when there was an appropriation by this legislature over $2 million for dump trucks and backhoes to be used uh, for mitigation, flood mitigation, to use to clear the roads for the Mayor's Council of Guam. But when the funds came out and the trucks came out and the backhoes came out, it was diverted to the Department of Public Works. While we still are able to use those backhoes and those dump trucks, um, it's whenever it's available. It's not when we need it. But they are being used by the Department of Public and, and rightly so. They, they are able to maintain it. They're able, they have the drivers. They have the, the capability. But someone was saying, why is it that uh, when we have a matai, you guys can't just come right away and clear our yard? Well, we can come and pick up your trash. We can come and put up your canopies and give you chairs. But we don't have the equipment to push the dirt, nor do we have the equipment to carry that dirt to where it's going to go. And so that's, that's the explanation for that. Angel, is there a suggestion that you might be able to give to the body or to the appropriations chair in terms of how we might be able to accomplish those um, set-asides in a transparent way so that we say, okay, um, this mayor didn't expend this amount of money in this fiscal year because we are setting $25,000 aside to add it on to our next year's budget so that we are, you know, because we intend to purchase this piece of heavy equipment that is sorely needed in our we village. Can, because because it, it really helps to inform this body of what the mayors are doing and then also the general public um, just so that we don't have this kind of yeah. misunderstanding in terms of what's being utilized and what is needed. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can, uh, because every, every village has their own separate account as far as these funds are concerned. Maybe the, what we may need to do is that, as I had mentioned earlier, this one size fits all is not really fair because Dededo gets 15,000 and Yamada gets 15,000. Did it do the 15,000 is gone in one day? Well, your Matic can save it for one month, you know. So maybe those are where we, we can come up. I mean, even the mayor's talk amongst can, can you buy it? Can you buy that equipment for me? And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. They all try to help each other. But I can show you the, the, the ledgers of how much they have as balances, where they've spent, and what they're trying to save to be able to purchase for a bigger ticket item, but, but th those are available. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have additional questions, but I'll go ahead and uh, have my colleagues ask All first. Right. Masi. Senator Tello, do you have questions? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for being here, and uh, again, a thorough um, testimony is greatly appreciated. Um, I'm trying to, you know, I, I was looking through the budget while you were talking, Angel, and trying to going back and follow to trying to multitask. But there was a section that you mentioned that, uh, in your testimony, and I'm trying to locate it, where you mentioned that you did not ask for uh, highway fund money to fund the operation. What, what section, is, what page was that that you said that? It's towards the end. 
toward the end? What, what yeah. is that? Um, I'm sorry, the, that, my testimony is not. That numbered, should be page uh, 11, and that's in reference to how they're being uh, appropriated funds. Okay. It's be very specific shit that we didn't ask to be appropriated okay. by all the other. Toward the end, the last, a second to the last. It's, it's, right, it's af right after the Liberation Memorial Fund. Right after the Liberation Memorial. Okay, that's like. Oh, got it, got it. Right after. Thank you for saying that. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, I'm, I, I want to stick to what the intent of these special funds are for and appropriated for. And I, and I'm, I thank you for recognizing that and that um, it's not anything that the Mayor's Council have ever asked for to be appropriated through these funds. So I hope this year, when we go through the budget, we'll keep that in mind and appreciate bringing that to the attention. Um, you know, I, I have to tell you, um, Angel, that uh, uh, and President Savaris, that I looked at the executive budget and, and what they've um, appropriated. You know, putting all of about six of us, including the legislature, in one bulk amount and. It does not look anywhere close to your requested amount, um, more like 2018 budget, but um, we'll, we'll do what we can on that. Um, I know that the mayors are the first responders. The importance of your office is greatly needed. Um, you did mention, though, you know, I know you're also looking at ways to cut cost, and I appreciate that. And it, though the good chair has not... Uh, finalize the budget yet for us to review and, and his suggestions. Please continue to bring things to his way. I saw that FEMA was just recognized a month ago and that's gonna take into consideration. Uh, you also mentioned how you're trying to look for office space, Angel. And um, may I make a suggestion, and, and it might not be this year, but um, there are a lot of schools out there that are underutilized. And one of them is Southern High. I know it's at a distance, but I'm sure Agate Pneumatic will like that idea. They don't have to travel far anymore, <laughs> especially on your Wednesday meetings. <laughs> but there's a lot of space at Southern High School for you to utilize there. And you might want to work with DOE and looking for some other schools that are underutilized. Um, that'll save you some money. Uh, the other part that you mentioned is the President's Contingency Fund. I do know important, how important it is, but I'm hoping that you can also look at the, uh, I believe you have a um, nonprofit uh, fund that you have the mayors put together. Can you kind of explain what you utilize that? Other than, I know that you donate um, money to certain organizations, um, things like that, but um, is there anything in, in that bylaws to allow you to use that funding for you know, hosting other um, dignitaries coming in? Yeah, we, we have, oh, actually each village has their own non-appropriated funds. These come for donations, uh, for use of equipment, and things like that, civil weddings and all that. You're talking about the Mayor's Council <clears throat> revolving fund. Yeah, the President's Contingency Fund well, where you're asking for $20,000. Yeah. But um, that have uh, payroll deducted every pay period, wow. uh, $25. That comes out to almost $16,000 a year, 17,000, that we put into those funds, into the Mayor's Council Revolving Fund. And now some people have said on radio that when the mayors go and have their meeting, they're using government funds to pay for their meal, which is absolutely not true. Oh, that I, I definitely know. I've been to some of your uh, meetings and, we, and you we guys pay, all potluck yes. and bring your own out of personal uh, We pay money. it out of our dues. And in fact, this last yeah. meeting, there was a request uh, to support uh, the Golfing Federation and to support uh, Regalo. And whenever the mayors vote to provide funding out of the Mayor's Council of Guam, it is usually out of their dues. Whatever money we have available, well, that's we good give to, to the hospital, we give to these organizations, uh, yeah. we give to UOG for a, is it an opening uh, dinner, an opening lunch, and things like that. So we're, we're not we're not using government funds for any of, any of this. This president's contingency fund is only when we have these off-island dignitaries. Uh, dignitaries come yeah. and you know the, the mayor hosts them, the president hosts them, 
And, uh, and let me just say, you didn't see anything in this budget about travel. Okay. That's because we have not okay. travel. Well, if, they, if the mayors travel, it's at their own expense. Okay. And I didn't bring it up, but I, I really wanted to see whether the, the GVB can set aside. I mean, these, these mayors and vice, they're also ambassadors. Exactly. And, and you may not know it, but the people that they have connected with, their sister cities that they have connected with, have continually come to Guam every single year. And you know what? In bigger groups. We're going to have in the next few weeks, an inaugural flight from Iloilo to Guam. And this was started by the Mayor's Council of Guam. We asked them if they can get an airline to fly directly from Iloilo to Guam instead of going from Iloilo to Manila to Guam. And it's going to become a reality. And these are the kind of things we get back from these sister cities. And though we get chastised because we're going there to see what they're doing or to meet them. It's, it's because we have formed a bond of friendship and leadership where they do best practices. And yeah, we, we get flack about the strawberry, but you know what, from that strawberry, we learned that we could do it here on Guam. And it is happening on Guam. Maybe not to the extent that you're doing it, but we are doing it. We learned that they can give their senior citizens free monthly movie tickets every month. Well, we're trying to do that here, to be able to, to provide our seniors an opportunity to, to instead of just play bingo all the time, to maybe go watch a movie or go watch a play. We, we've, we've learned that, uh, well, maybe the mayor can expound more on what, because she's, she has her sister city mayors that she's communicated with. But, you know, even though we haven't gone there, they have not stopped coming here. And, and that's thank the you. bottom. They've, they've continued to come and support us. Angel, uh, thank you so much, and, and Mayor Savaris. And I, I ask you, please don't dis be discouraged by uh, fake news or bad publicity with regards to this, because as the Deputy General Manager of the Guam Visitors Bureau when I was there, I saw firsthand uh, what your efforts have done to increase um, more visitors to Guam and to bring that tie. So I ask you not to be discouraged. Um, wherever possible needed that you go out to, to bring this um, collaboration between two countries together, I, I think it's, a, it's greatly needed and it's actually showing today uh, the fruits of, yeah. of your labor. Sports Tourism Center didn't just happen. Yeah. Sports Tourism happened because we started it. Yes, exactly. And we, we actually we have went a, there and um, invited them, bring your team and, in, and, and compete with our teams. Well, I ask you, Mary, that uh, I know that uh, GVB has funding for this. And instead of utilizing your funds uh, to go on these trips, I think that you should um, ask GVB, uh, partner with them, to actually bring a mayor along to c create that uh, um, collaboration wherever they go, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, anywhere. Um, so I ask if, if you can do that, and I'll be happy to help you to open that door uh, for you. the future. Um, uh, moving on, I just want it so whatever funds you can use in your revolving fund uh, to help cut costs, because like I said, the 2020 budget from the executive branch uh, has cut quite a bit. Um, the oversight... Okay, on your public safety and social education program, where you have funding um, that was provided uh, for you in FY18 at 416,000, it says that this money is used for your 19 districts to reduce underage drinking, so promotion, marketing to, to, uh, uh, for underage drinking, uh, support traffic safety, reduce drug-related violence, abuse, and all that, and then you and and to support organized sports programs, you know it, it was uh, a concern I have is that there there be a balance to this. I know there's a lot of sports out there that you encourage. It helps health and everything like that. But if there's somebody who oversees this to ensure there's a balance with sports and a balance with outreach programs for you know don't drink um, uh, safety, don't do drugs, say no to drugs. 
Do you have somebody overseeing for that balance? Mayor Suarez, please. Um, Senator, thank you for the question. And our Guam Youth Basketball Association is played every summer at our, our Stumbo Gym, the Jigo Gymnasium, and the Sports Complex. And the, thing, the first thing that the kids learn is about being drug, alcohol, and so uh, before practice, there's a pledge that all the players and coaches say, I will be a drug-free, alcohol-free, tobacco-free citizen. And, and then they do this pledge before game time. Our program has been in existence for over 10 years uh, because we have more villages that are now opening uh, their own sports basketball program. Um, so uh, take that pledge. Coaches also need to go through that. Uh, uh, youth football organization mm, has, yeah. as far as I know, has not committed to, be, to being, uh, taking that pledge yet. But baseball has, soccer, um, tennis, paddling, um, and also school programs. Uh, we see recent you know, mock trial, robotics, uh, real world design, um, all kinds of competition from school to uh, community programs. And most of them, I say 90% of them, do focus on being drug, alcohol, and tobacco free citizens. Thank you so much for that. A lot of people need to realize that that's where that funding goes to, and it's more just about more than just about sports. Uh, lastly, Mr. Chair, uh, you did, I just wanted to make a comment. You did mention on number six uh, regarding the economic develop on the opportunity zone. I do have a bill that does that, that changes it from five years to increase it back to ten. So uh, the bill is already out. I already introduced it, so I could use the mayor's help in encouraging the oversight chair to uh, report this bill out uh, for, because we already had a committee, uh, yeah. we already had a public hearing on this. Yes, so and I there could actually, use your help to push that out. There okay. are actually 12 <laughs> villages that have been identified that have uh, opportunities. So much for all you're doing, and please don't let uh, negative uh, comments, uh, you know, distract you. Number one, distract you or discourage you from continuing the good work that you do at the Mayor's Council. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's never enough negative. Angel knows that and, Melissa, and the Mayor knows that. All the Mayors know that. Everybody's always gonna talk cheap shop, but the numbers will, will prove itself, okay? The numbers will prove itself. And I'm just waiting to see the contract come out for, for Umatic and uh, Mangino to get their gym, the million dollars that was uh, from DOI. So hopefully that happens soon. Then I know you're going to ask for money for people, but uh, <laughs> Senator Castro. It's three additional workers. <laughs> we'll worry about that then, because it is going to take a two or three years before that happens. Senator Castro, uh, your questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple statements here, and then uh, some, some words of encouragement, and, and then a couple specific questions that came my way from uh, some of my colleagues. But I, I do want to state for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, that for as long as I can remember, uh, it's been the mayors and vice mayors who've been the most visible, at least in my life growing up in, in my village of Barragada, right? Uh, you're looking at those folks all the time when they address crime, even to this day. My hat's off to the mayors, especially June Blas and vice mayor. They're the ones who respond in the middle of the night, aside from GPD, uh, when life is not immediately threatened, that come, come to my house or to the neighbor's house. And, and, um, and I mention that for different reasons, and I'll get to that. But also, you know, it's important, especially for our new residents of the territory, uh, to know that you folks are the ones who are uh, boots on the ground in terms of youth sports, as Senator Taitigui mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of feasts and religious holidays and other types of holidays, educational extension opportunities. We're talking about tutoring or access to computers in each of your mayoral offices. Uh, we're talking about beautification and various families' individual needs. Uh, all too often, it's, many of us are not aware that you're the ones who provide the chairs, the canopies, the cascal, the escort during funerals, and so forth. And, and I, I mention that for the public record. For us, as elected officials and to the government officials, the bureaucrats who are watching or who are in the room, we know this already. But the listening audience, a lot of that is taken for granted. And so it makes sense that in, in areas outside of law enforcement, perhaps, you're the first line, again, as another colleague had referenced, 
you're the first line of public services outside of public health, protection of life. Uh, you're the closest line of, of service there. Mr. Sablan, I, I think your statement, this, this is the first time I've seen it in writing and, and I appreciate it and it's the first time I've heard it. I'm sure it's not the first time it's been said, but it's the first time I've heard it. And I agree with you that this one size fits all and distribution of funds doesn't seem fair. Frankly, you're being diplomatic in your statement. I don't think it fits the needs of any of the villages and I don't even think it works. Uh, so I've, I've leaned over here and I had a sidebar with the chairman offering my service uh, to sit down and learn and understand this process. It's very complex. I mean, you're talking about the entire, entire central government at the apex of your office in your village. And you know, Mayor, I've been hard on you, not necessarily you directly, uh, Mayor Savarez, so I'm not necessarily apologizing, but I was hard on you, and, and, but it wasn't fair. I went to Sagan Lenazen, and I was very critical of the amount of trash in the area, being environmentally conscious, like I'd say 15 out of 15 senators in the 35th. But it wasn't until I got there with the backhoes and the dump trucks, special thanks to the Calvo administration at the time, Eric Palacios and those corporate partners who came there to scoop it up because I brought a team of volunteers, not once, Mayor, but twice. And we cleaned up dozens of trash and other organizations do the same thing throughout the island. But my point would be, when we removed some of those white goods in the trash, it took heavy equipment that you didn't have to remove that. And so my hat's off to you and, I'm, and I publicly commend you for that. All of you, all of you for that. Um, on another note, Mr. Chairman, so again, uh, the point of that discussion, my statement was that I, I am willing to commit to sit down with the oversight chair and, and the budget chairman here to find uh, a way, an innovative way at deriving at a formula, Mr. Sablan, whether it takes into consideration land mass or population or, f or sporting fields and activities. Uh, I don't think necessarily that roads is a true indicator of activity in a village, although it makes sense. I mean, after all, you got to cut the grass around the roads, but, but there's so much more going on in different villages, and I think you need to have the proper allocation of funds to address that um, with some level of satisfaction to the constituencies you serve. On another note, with respect to data, um, and you know, my colleague here, she's always pushing the envelope on innovation, and my other colleague is the oversight chair now of, of my home agency, the Bureau of Planning. This is a perennial problem. So as you address the issue of uh, residency verifications, you know, I can tell you that um, all that proves is that you may know that resident if you use that GPA record. Other than that, um, it's easy, not to fake, but to hold maybe dual residencies, to put it diplomatically. I can give you my GPA bill billing for my father's house, but I could be physically uh, residing in the village of, I don't know, Zonia, as an example, Dededo. Uh, and so it's important, I use that to illustrate the importance of the need to collaborate, and you might be onto something if we can get the support of, of the ruling majority here, to have a bipartisan approach to a central database, something that BSP had looked up in the past, something that I know that this administration is uh, addressing right now, because your information is so vital to agencies like GMHA when they're attempting to collect. I'll give you an example. As a former chairman of the Guam Memorial Hospital Management Team, uh, H-Man at the time under Governor Calvo, a lot of the uncollectibles were because they were using fake aliases, maybe even legitimate aliases like Will or William, but listing the same residents in a single dwelling unit that may not even be legitimate in Gura's eyes or any other federal subsidized program. And so when you connect the dots, you're gonna see that there's a lot of discrepancies in our resident data, and I encourage you, we could probably qualify for some kind of a federal grant, but maybe then you can weave that into an additional appropriation if the chairman can identify the funds to address that. Because I think if your office can provide a very functional kernel of data, other agencies can use it, DRT, DMV, GMHA, BSP, et cetera, and also the schools for purposes of identifying uh, location, primary location of the student, right? Because we have some people come from out of district when they choose to disclose that. Um, I also had a sidebar with the chairman, uh, the oversight chairman here, very briefly, uh, but to the point of Senator Taitugui again, 
you know, youth sports, I, I, really, want, I really want to uh, have another conversation with the respective chair on the issue of youth sports and emerging sports. You mentioned paddling, ma'am, and I appreciate that. But you also have youth football. And uh, if there's a statement I can remember growing up from my mom who just passed last year was, you can be poor but be happy. And I'm going to tell you, based on my experience, and I'm, I'm no one to tell you, I'm, I'm going to reiterate for the record, that even when in our darkest hour of fiscal restraint as a government, we can keep kids occupied in the busyness of sports and families so close together. But you know what the biggest hurdle to that is money for equipment and the fees that the league has to pay to keep the lights on, etc. I am a volunteer with the Guam Raiders football organization and thousands of families and kids come out, but not every family can afford $190. And so whatever I can do to work with Senator Peter Tzerlahi here, who's gonna push probably for a less restrictive appropriation so that you can move money around and innovative ways to generate revenue, you have my full support if, if you can commit to earmarking it to youth sports, emerging sports such as women's football, that was unheard of in my time. Women's football is a growing sport, and that's awesome. Um, and so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the extended opportunity to provide comment. It wasn't brief comment, but provide comment. I do have a specific question that one of my colleagues asked that I can ask for, during my time. Um, commendations again to the Mayor's Council and all that you do to innovate uh, in terms of your fiestas and your villages. I think that's really awesome to spark entrepreneurship and to sell produce and other wares that are generated from your village. A question for the panel would be, uh, how much uh, money is generated on an annual basis, do you think, based off the top of your head, uh, maybe you can use a model village, and then what are those monies used for? And that question is for the panel, and then I'll close. So, um, Senator, thank you for the question. And in Derido alone, um, I don't have a festival because I have a weekly weekend flea market that drives my people, you know, uh, to a certain area. So in our case, in the flea market area, and our flea market is tied in at the farmer's co-op on Saturdays and Sundays. And what we generate is roughly, if all the spaces are filled uh, on, on during the both Saturday and Sundays, uh, we generate between 6,500 to about 7,000 per month. And uh, so times 12 months. Uh, what we do with that is um, we give humanitarian assistance for off-island medical referrals. They must have the proper documents, referral from a licensed physician on Guam, uh, uh, proof of travel uh, document, you know, an e-ticket or a reservation that's already been confirmed. Uh, and of course, they must be a, a resident of the village. Uh, second, that we do we fire victims? Those are our two humanitarian assistance. Fire victims, uh, if they own, you are a victim in your, um, in your home as well. So if they're a resident of Dedido and they are fire victims, we do give humanitarian assistance as well, to immediate hu humanitarian assistance as far as cash is concerned. Um, we also sponsor, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, youth teams, youth programs. Um, recent, two years ago, we sponsored the Ukudu High School mock trial team that went uh, to compete off island. Uh, this past year, uh, just a few months ago, we sponsored the, uh, the real world design team from JFK that took the national and international uh, trophies. And so we're really proud of them. They are uh, three out of the seven students were from Dedido. We sponsor all of our sports teams, youth teams. Uh, just this past week, we have our municipal planning council meetings every second Tuesday. And just this past Tuesday, we um, got a request from the soccer moms uh, who are mothers out of the Dedido Soccer Club and formed a team. And because they're also leading to healthy lifestyles, you know, physical fitness, and taking their, as a family, uh, our council um, sponsor was agree, a motion to uh, sponsor them. So, and then the immediate needs of, uh, I, when, when uh, Mayor, uh, Senator Terlahi was a mayor, uh, three villages got together, Jigo to Muning, I mean, Jigo, Dedido, and Jotnia, and bought backos. 
Uh, right now, only the Dedi Tobacco is still op in operation because uh, when we need parts, the vendor will not take purchase order, government purchase order, because of the delay in payments. So we have an open request with um, my municipal planning council members who have approved that as long as we follow the procurement law and our vendors, the, the vendors that we deal with to get parts for the backhoe, um, you know, know that we're paying by check. Uh, we pay for any repairs that need to uh, be made on our heavy equipment. Uh, as you know, if you don't realize, what, last year we inherited the Machechi Community Center from Gura, and we have that for 20 years. Uh, recently, we've had plumbing problems with the sewer connection, and we pay for uh, repairs on that. So, you know, repairs for our facilities to keep it maintained uh, to, for humanitarian purposes. So the 7,000 that comes in goes right back out. Uh, and, and I know that when my colleagues have their night markets or their festivals in their villages, the money comes in, they spend to, to have the event, the money that comes in goes back to the humanitarian assistance and supports that we have for our community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. You're also the president of the council, right? Thank you, that's Madam correct, President. Yeah. So that satisfies my question uh, for that part. The second part would be, so this is the equivalent of a uh, non-appropriated fund for DOE as an example. So my follow-up question would be, obviously, I'm, I'm gonna have to assume in good faith that the council and the respective villages maintain an accurate record because this is not reflected in the budget. Would you like to comment briefly yeah. about that? Well, Senator, the, the NAF of every village is audited every single year. And okay. I, you probably, this last year, because there's been a changeover from uh, previous to not the, the current um, auditor, uh, we've had everything prepared for them to come and for every village to submit all their documents for, for um, but it is audited every single year. That's encouraging, Mr. Sablon. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to close with a question. Uh, the Amatic mayor may choose uh, not to respond. I see him in the audience off a day, Mayor Bada. Um, you know, and this is, I, I'm speaking out of ignorance here, so I'm just not aware, and, and this is a great opportunity for me to learn more about how you function. Uh, take, for example, the village of Homate, the village by the sea. Uh, there's severe compromise, extreme compromise to the seawall. Uh, this is not a, a, a spackle job, right? This is not even an 8 by 8 by 16 cylinder, I mean a, a block job. We're talking about millions upon millions of mitigation monies how does the village, and, and it's germane to the budget because, frankly, I think it even might extend into the need for federal intervention. How does a village like yours, and you could choose not to respond or anybody can jump in here, deal with major infrastructure issues such as a seawall if it goes even beyond the entire budget of the council? Uh, Mayor Bada, would, do you have any idea? Um, Senator, um, I just spoke to the governor, uh, Santa Rita Mayor, Maritza Mayor, and I, we had a meeting at the governor's office concerning uh, my bridge, you know, the, the erosion and the debris that gets stuck under the bridge, like the, uh, and, and the beach site. But the, the meeting was all about um, the river, how it overflows. Because the river was shallow, and what the director is saying about, you know, the, the pigs uh, um, uh, destroying the the side of the river and then the erosions just go right through into the river. And that's how our river gets really, really bad when uh, there's, a, there's a flood. That's the only problem I have down there is my, my bridge. It's kind of low, it's only five feet. And uh, when, the, when the river starts coming out fast, the water goes up high. And every night when it rains, there's only one house, to actually two houses that have to stay up all night to just keep an eye and make sure that they're safe. Every time it rains down there and it's gonna flood, I have to stay up till 12 midnight waiting for the rain to stop to make sure that those two um, constituents of mine, the residents are safe. And that's the issue that we're having down in the south is uh, our flooding problems and erosion. You saw Senator, the, the beach side, how it's eating the cemetery. And I, I made a suggestion right now, I'm, I'm trying to write a letter uh, we have all those uh, railing blocks that are left behind when they put new railings in Pneumatic 
I Get You Mad at wrote. There's so many of those that we can use to, for temporary use for the, for the cemetery. And I want to bring that up to the governor because that meeting that we had, one of my constituents came to me and told me about it. So they're all up at, at, the, at the hillside. They're all stuck, stacked up in, in bundles. And maybe, you know, they can use that for the time being to save so the cemetery can be saved. So wait, you know, us keep talking and talking and not, nothing being done. It's a lot of erosion just keeps happening every time it floods. And uh, the former senator, Tom Morrison, saw that. Um, uh, public Health, Guam EPA were there. Um, so I'm here just waiting. We speak about it, but nothing has been done yet. I know my roads repaired. Um, a lot of my, my village is, is repaired. The only problem I have now is that erosion in the cemetery. Every time election comes, they attack me on that. So that's my only thing now I have to fix to make everything, you know, stay at ease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I guess your solution then would be as long as you can control the rain to prevent erosion, you'll be all right your next election. Uh, in all seriousness, Mr. Chairman, this is a really big issue uh, that uh, coast, coastal villages have to deal with. I would just encourage you and our good chairman of the F budget committee here uh, to look beyond local appropriations because I, I don't think local monies can solve the mitigation needs of your village as an example. And so uh, I'd just like to leave that for the record. Uh, key terms would include things like resiliency and climate change. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, it's my turn. I got a bunch of questions for you, uh, Premier Angel and uh, Premier Mayor, President. But I'm gonna keep it very simple, okay? Uh, you talk about power, power bills you're paying. Why haven't you guys pursued solar power? Something that you all need to pursue is solar power, getting solar, solar panels, whatever, to reduce your power consumption. GPA may not like that, but they're not, a, they're not keeping up to speed with everybody. The people of Guam paying more for power, and then when it doesn't even have a storm, then we don't have, we don't have power, uh, might as well go solar. Because when there's no storm, which is majority of the time, at least your lights are on, and if you need to get batteries, then so be it, get batteries. I mean, that, that, that may be able to solve some of your problems. Um, and you can, you can, you, are you willing to answer that about the solar or you want to save that and just send, send a, a respond to me? Well, actually I had mentioned that our power bill has been going down because we're changing interior, interior incandescent lights to, to LED. So it has reflected in a reduction of our power consumption already. The reason why we haven't actually gone through the solar thing is because as I had mentioned earlier, many of our buildings have roof leaks cracks that we need to repair first before we even put a solar system on top of it. And so that's what we want to do first before we actually put out the, the but we have been actively speaking about putting solar systems in our, in our facilities. Okay, are, are, are your offices, the mayor's offices throughout the island, are they insured or no? Not yes. insured? None. We have no insurance at all. Okay, well maybe that's something that you should all look forward to. I mean, because there's, it's almost as bad as some of the agencies I know of. They got insurance, they don't even make claim, but that's okay. We'll go after them later. Um, Gura, have, have, the, have, have the, MC, the municipal planning the council pursued trying to get Gura grants? You know, they build the, the, the um, police precincts, fire stations, they build a bunch of buildings. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if, have you pursued that? To build some the, of your the community block development grant, yes. Uh, actually, Gura provides assistance. In fact, Yamatic got approval uh, this year from uh, Gura. MTM got approval from Gura. Uh, we, we haven't asked Gura to assist us in getting a municipal building because uh, a couple of years ago, they said that they were going to build their own building back here next to Hulali and that they were willing to give us their building in Sinahanya to be our municipal building. Well, of course, we're still waiting for that. But as far as the is concerned, they are, they, they are very supportive. They, they do help the villages in getting uh, community block grants. Okay, I will ask them to help you get a grant because I'm hoping that their building in Sinahanya goes to Guam Housing. And then get your <laughs> brand new building so it can be easily insured. You need, you need a new building, you don't? Yes. We need to work this out. Um, Next question is, um, you identified, um, wow, 
I think Senator Tell already asked a question about the uh, public safety and social program you have, so I'll skip that. Um, but but you you've identified how many uh, you've identified like grass cutting and and stuff like that. How many PTOs or nonprofit organizations have participated and even asked? to get a contract for the schools or any of the They, they have cutting. actually asked. In fact, some of them do it on their own. When, right. when they think that we're behind in cutting the grass, they do it on their own. But we can't technically pay any of them because of not. It's, it's not. That's why we're asking if you give us that uh, in, in uh, statute, then we can legally uh, cover for their expenses. If not pay them, at least buy them their fuel, buy them their, you know, their equipment. So... Yeah, because yes, but there are some NGOs, <laughs> there's some non-profit, just non-PTOs that I've been asking if they can provide this type of work. Okay, because, you know, you know, and you probably heard me say that on other budget hearings, uh, you have DOC, you have other agencies that actually support the mayors out there, and I'm just curious, and they've said they've done it, they've never gotten any equipment, or any, and I, I don't expect them to get a payment, yeah. but how, how do you offset the well, funding you <clears> get for grass cutting, and you have other agencies helping you, and then... You still have the money, but they're not, they're not getting any payment. So I'm just trying well, to understand well, how that works. DOC does not get payment, but they do get equipment. They do get fed. They do get the fuel from our accounts. Okay, but when you say they get equipment, they get fed, they get fuel, how do you fund that? From the grass maintenance fund. Okay. Okay, that, that, that was an easy one. Okay, the feeding, um, actually, the feeding, though, comes out of the mayor's own NAF. But that one we question too because, you know, they, they do get their lunch daily. So I've asked the, the deputy, I said, well, what happens to the lunch that they get if we're going to feed them? Uh, because they work hard, they eat more. Okay. Okay. I understand that you, you've identified that how the, uh, municipal, the, the mayor's council of Guam, not from your choosing, is funded by TAF and all the different special funds. Are you asking specifically then that the mayor's council be funded by the general fund and you still be able to make, meet all the needs that you've expressed? And I'm, I'm, I want you to be very careful how you answer that because <laughs> the different special funds that you provided actually helps you and prevents you from spending it for other than what it was intended. Oh, well, in this case, Senator, <laughs> the highway fund was appropriated to us for use for personnel. And we know that that is not allowable. And now I think the statute that says you can't use the highway fund for anything else. But we didn't. <laughs> they gave us that eight point some million from the highway fund. You know, our personnel budget is eight some point million. So we're, where do you think we're going to pay it from, the, per the personnel from? It's going to have to come out of that fund. And we didn't ask for that. We've been chastised for that. We'd love to have that eight point some million used for the federal highways, for the routed roads. But you gave it to us to fund other things. The, the limited gaming fund, even though you put it into, a, into our pro, you know that we can't use it for anything else but recreational facilities and uniforms and things like that. We can't use it for personnel. The Territorial Education Fund, again, we get funding from that. But it's not just used for territorial education, it's used for other stuff. So a lot of these special funding sources that are given to us as funding sources, our hands are tied because you gave us that as the funding source to fund our requested appropriation, not necessarily to fund what is allowable under law for those uh, funding sources. So I just want to make it clear that, that it is not the Mayor's Council okay. that decided to not use those funds the way they're supposed to be used. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy you, say, you stated that and Senator Tello asked that because I don't believe any agency should get funding from a special fund and not do what the special funds intend. I okay? agree. And, and, and I, I'm very happy you said that. Um, gosh, I had a bunch of questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that because I'm going to have to send you a letter and ask you other questions. But you identified... 
Public Law 34-42. I, I got a... Limited gaming fund. Okay, you, you've, you've answered that. I'm not going to question that any further. But I don't, I don't think any of our colleagues have any other questions, but I don't want you to leave because we have one public participation, and that's Mr. Me that will speak. And I don't want you to leave and then uh, whatever he says, I want to make sure that you're, you folks are available, okay? So I would ask Mr. Me, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Is it fair for me to say that I need to ask the, the chair pers person of budget and finance to either do your budget statue under discretionary budget or even a blanket authority uh, appropriation? Whichever, whichever uh, uh, that the, uh, the chair would, would say would be appropriate, it works both ways. Either one would, would do the work that, because you, the mayor's council has got so many things that they, they have to do within the villages. Well, so, maybe we would appreciate a lump sum. So I'm going to put the, uh, the chairman on the spot here. Which one would be most appropriate? A blanket authority or a discretionary authority? Well, uh, it up to you. well and, and, I, and I agree with uh, Angel, Premier Angel, uh, Senator Trelai, is that because they're receiving special funds, but at the same time, their hands are being tied where they're not able to fulfill the special funds intent. Okay, and trying to bring special funds back to its, the way it was, how it was created, like Senator Tello brought up, and many of my colleagues will say the same thing. If you're going to get highway funds, then you fix your highway. Nothing else. If you're going to get education funds, then just do what it was intended. If not, then agencies that need those special funds get the special funds, but then they reduce the general fund so the other agencies that need the general fund can be able to do what they need to do. Because I know that some of the things Mr. Mead probably bring up is issues that relate to these funds. The, the improper, I'm not going to say the improper use, but I guess the, the way it was funded in the budget shouldn't have happened. And there's a new, there's a new breed in the legislature, so we're going to work that and figure that and fix that. Okay, so we'll work in favor of, of every, every agency, but just understand, there's only so much money out there. And exactly what you're saying is that how you try to get the mayors to work to put money together to buy your equipment. Well, I think if, if, if the money is given to you in lump sum, then you can say that up front. You can all agree, we're gonna buy a, a backhoe, it's under the mayor's council, Everybody gets to share it. In times of typhoon, it should go to the priority villages, the southern, because the northern mayor of Savars has her own backhoe. She should be able to share that down south, but we'll work that. You guys figure that out. That shouldn't be in our business. What you do in your, in your agency should be what you need to do. Now, in reference to you mentioned employees needing hazardous pay, tell your oversight chair, okay? Send the letters to him. And if you want, CC me a copy so that I'll remind my, my colleagues. And Peter, Peter, where's the bill? Because it, you're right. You have employees out there. You're doing hazardous work, and you're not getting paid. And, and that's not right. You know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Let's make this work because it's all about the people of Guam. It's not about me. It's about the people of Guam. And I, that's why I brought up the Yamatic about their gym. Get Parks and Rec to build your gym and even Mingilo. I think Mingilo is the other gym. Because I know Santa Rita will be asking very soon and my family's, my wife's family's from Santa Rita, so I have to be very mindful of Mr. Mayor Alvarez. Mr. Mead, would you please uh, start with your testimony and be kind. Thank you, as, sir. As, as I was listening, I have, uh, I, 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 I'll wait. In listening to uh, Angel's prison, and I can call him Angel because we go back. 
you talk about sports, this is the guy. 21, 21 teams? Back in Jigo in the day, 99 or around in then, 21 softball teams. They had fast pitch women, co-ed, men slow pitch, women slow pitch. He helped me support my family when I umpired all those games. So, And then the mayor of Savars, uh, son, I want to say, in the old Dededo Middle School was my student, so we all go way back. And I wanted to uh, preface that and say that hopefully uh, I've edited what I started to say and I'll send it to you later as my official presentation. I um, want no one to take offense to whatever I say here uh, because it's based on uh, what I see as a, a person living on this island. And I'm glad to see that my mayor came today. I always call him my mayor, because he is, came today. And I can speak to uh, those folks. When you speak to uh, not receiving hazardous duty pay for what they do, um, I have to agree with that. The other issue is, is what happens if they're injured? If they're not on overtime pay and they're out there with the grace of their goodwill, what happens if they get injured? The government of Guam and, and workers' comp won't cover it. They're on their own. So the takeaways from today may be that there needs to be some changes made with uh, the employees and some of those. I don't know if they're classified or unclassified. Un and again, unclassified employees have a different you know, a different status within the government itself anyway. So there needs to be consideration. Anyway, let me read uh, some of the things that I, I edited. <clears throat> uh, i just say, uh, begin by half a day, good morning. My name is Barry Mead, everybody knows who I am. I'm here today as a concerned citizen with respect to the budget for the Mayor's Council of Guam. And I wrote here that I wish I had spoken to Angel before today, as now my testimony might be considered to be in support of the MCOG budget request where before it was critical. Still critical. And as Angel said, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to the breakdown of funds. And when you look at the funds, that, that how they are broken down, when you, when you look at the, the highway fund itself, uh, the one from where we go do, uh, uh, what is it called? Street maintenance and beautification. This, this budget is, is based upon a 10-year-old study Thank you. This budget is based on a 10-year-old Department of Public Works roads pavement inventory. 10 years old. And it only speaks to pavement. Doesn't speak to unpaved roads that all the villages have so many of. And it's broken down based on district local mileage where Dededo receives a total of $160,000 and Santa Rita gets $55,000. Or, yeah, $45,000. So the disparity there, not saying Dededo doesn't deserve, but when you look at the disparity of how it's distributed between all the other villages, then one can come up with the answer of, why is it this way here, as opposed to why is it that way there? And if you can't, and I'll say this, if you can't get anybody to volunteer or uh, 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 nonprofit, I'll create my own nonprofit because I'd gladly uh, cut the grass at Southern High for $65,000 a year. And Santa Rita gets a budget of $65,000 a year for Truman Elementary, Southern High, and the Alternative School. Two of those schools are across the street from where I live. How easy it would be for that much money. Anyway, the manner in which the funds are appropriated must be a budgetary and accounting nightmare for the mayors and the MCOG. Maybe, and this was a question, this was a conversation by allocating X number of dollars from the general fund and tell the MCOG to have a nice day would be a quick fix. But it's the accountability factor. On the other hand, maybe by giving some of these functions back 
to those that were and should be responsible would be the fix. I have to scroll down. We have to remember that the mayors are now responsible for mayors are now responsible for what was passed along to them due to the inabilities of those responsible to perform. Parks and Rec. Villages now take care of their softball fields and other recreational facilities. Is the budget that's, that's given to them adequate to do that? No. No, just look at the facilities. Parks and Rec. GDOE. A million dollars is taken out of the uh, uh, Education Futures Fund and given to the mayors for maintenance of just cutting the grass at all the schools, save those that are on contract. Million dollars. But does that, in fact, allow for the mayors to be able to do that? And then, of course, DPW. I wrote in my original uh, writings about I challenge people to drive down uh, along Route 5 from Camp Covington to the village of Santa Rita. I drive on the wrong side of the road because that's the smooth side. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got two new cars. I don't need shocks, tires, and everything else like I've had to put on cars. And there were some, they put in some sewers, but they never, well, before then the road was no good anyway. And now it's worse. And I've posted pictures on Facebook and sent them to the governor's office, but, you know. But the mayors are now being tasked with doing something about that. That's not their job. Quite honestly, that's not their job. Uh, the way I got all the information that I got was I sent a FOIA request on July 9th in 2018, a little, right out a year ago. And I have to say, of all the, uh, to the executive director of MCOG and received the most timely, complete response to any FOIA I have ever sent. And that includes GMH, GDOE numerous times, and I even threatened to do it when I was on the education board, if you remember. You can't get the information. But I got that back within five days. Complete. I have it all right here. I sent it to you all. And as you see in those documents and in that budget from before, I wrote you could, it, the, could be perceived as a misusage of people's money. And what prompted that FOIA was when there was a discussion going on and before the 34th legislature passed the gasoline tax increase. And the reason for the concern was that this tax increase was predicated upon the governor saying that the Territorial Highway Fund had no money. Wait a minute, where's the money? Well, let's go find out. Find out that six, a little over $6 million was appropriated to cover the salary of all but 17 employees in the governor's offices and the MCOG. So here we are, all the people of Guam are, are affected by this tax increase in more ways than one. It's more than just going to the pump and filling up your car with gas. It's also pay less supermarkets filling up their vehicles with gas and the trucking companies filling up their vehicles with gas of which they take the stuff to the store and the store has to pay the price and of course they pass it along to the consumer so we get the double whammy. We know, and I'm like, well, I don't get it at the pump because I can go where Joe goes, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. It still gets passed along. So instead of just paying the 1% increase to the tax, you get everything else added on top. So that's why I'm saying delete or remove the MCOG funding source away from the highway funds and use the highway funds to fix that road I drive every day that's wrecking my cars. 
and fund the, 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 the mayor's office with this adequate funds to do the jobs that they are responsible for. Now, giving back the, the softball fields and the sports complexes to Parks and Rec at the current time would be a failure. It was a failure then, it'll be a failure now. Why? Because they don't have the people, they don't have the equipment, they can't maintain Paseo Stadium as it is. Which for informational purposes was built by a grant from the Department of the Interior for food production services. Ironic, huh? One of the downsides though from all of this is that there are 214 employees but there are also 147 vehicles. The director speaks to they don't have the right vehicles and he's correct. They have a lot of pickup trucks, a lot of new pickup trucks. They have a lot of cars. They have six total uh, uh, flatbed trucks, one dump truck, and Talafofo has an ambulance. Those are the 1993 model. And some of these aren't working. So go back to my old days when I was in the Army. Why don't the mayors have a motor pool where they put X number of dump trucks and X number of backhoes and X number of forklifts or whatever it is they all need that can be serviced and maintained and checked out as each village needs, each village needs that piece of equipment. I sent pictures out of, the, of some of the mayor's offices with the, uh, the uh, junior ORDOT dumps. And the assumption is that the mayors are going around with the pickup trucks picking up all this stuff and collecting it and putting it at their office space because they have no way of disposing of it after that. So instead of having it uh, around our village, the mayors keep it up at their offices, and that's where it sits. And it needs to be disposed of. But if they don't have the equipment and vehicles to do it with, have a nice day. And if none of their employees are licensed to drive those vehicles, have a worse day. One of the uh, concerns I have MCOG office has seven employees, seven vehicles, and seven gas cards. When I worked at the Department of Commerce, I co-authored the Guam Product Seal Law. As such, I was the person that went out and certified people or businesses to get the Guam Product Seal, and I also went out to the businesses that were selling stuff illegally and fining them. I used my own car, and I paid for my own gas. And I paid for my own, used my own car and my own gas to drive back and forth from Santa Rita to Tamuning. Now granted, there are things that people need to do. But I will have to ask why. We have seven employees, seven different vehicles, and seven gas cards. 147 total vehicles in the, in the mayor's offices, 73 fleet gas cards signed out to individuals by name, and I have the credit card numbers, with, I would hope, some kind of regulation, some kind of Control. Jonia for their six vehicles, and this was up through uh, uh, 7 13, 2018. The village of Jonia had six vehicles, including a, 19, a 2016 Ram 2015 Tacoma and four cards. Spent $12,666.53 for gas. On the same time frame, I spent $4,300 for three vehicles and drove my kids round trip 32 miles a day, taking them to work. Now that might not be a good comparison because you know, the folks in Jonia have a lot to do. 
But at the same time, are we controlling it? Are we keeping mileage records of the vehicles? It was reported to me that one employee, I don't want to say the village because if I'm wrong, I'll get crucified. I'm going to get crucified anyway. Uh, went on vacation off island. Parked the vehicle at his house, took the keys with him and his credit card. That does not bode well for the perception of what are we doing. What are we doing to control these things, to ensure that we are not misusing the funds? In the budget that we have here, and that was why I was glad you brought it up, the mayors get $608,000 from limited gaming funds. Where, where is that money spent? In their offices. The rest of them we can pretty much tell about, but we are taking street maintenance and beautification from the tourist attraction fund. Their island-wide beautification funds of 471000 from the tourist attraction fund again. GCC gets money from the tourist attraction fund. It seems like everybody in the world that needs money gets some TAF. So that when it comes up short, guess what? Who gets cut first? It's an unknown funding source. And that's the habit of the government of Guam in the past. Is, is making funding appropriations that look good on paper and might satisfy what the, 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 the department is asking for. But it's an unknown. As I testified for GCC, they're going to come up real short because we don't have any H2s. And that, I don't care how much you're charging them, I, what, what, you raise it to $1,000 or $2,000 per H2 person. If they don't bring them into Guam, they don't pay the fine or the, the fee. And if they don't pay the fee, GCC doesn't get the money. And the same thing here. Okay, moving on, moving on. Uh, I said that before, skip that, skip that, I want to, okay, so, finally, as I said in previous testimony, and I'll say it again, if you, Guam legislature, wish to help the people of Guam economically, then you can start by reducing the bloated and overspending of the government of Guam. This hearing today is a perfect starting point as the recent increase in gasoline taxes can be directly associated to the MCOG budget. By streamlining and right-sizing or right-budgeting of the MCOG and the mayor's offices you can, and, and returning the funding to the Territorial Highway Fund, you can then repeal the recent tax increase. And it is that simple. Sorry, Angel. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mead. I don't think there's any response needed from the mayors. Okay. Um, there, there's, there's, does any of my colleagues want to say anything? Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up right now. Okay, did, did, did you feel you needed to respond, oh. uh, Mr. Well, exactly, Angel, or? You know, Barry. Exactly what we were saying. We yes. get t castigated and chastised for a funding source we, were, we never even asked to be a part of. So Got it. thank you for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> we don't have credit cards. We have gas cards and can only be used for fuel. Um, he says we sp Jonia spent 12000 Well, you know, it's probably for every village. I mean, our workers are not Monday to Friday. There's seven days a week. Funeral escorts, uh, all these marathon escorts, delivering canopies and chairs, um, doing the sports programs, things like that. They're, they're, they're all justified. And there is accountability because every time you gas, you have to put your mileage. And GSA takes care of that. And nobody can use gas and nobody can purchase gas unless they're authorized by GSA. And no, the Mayor's Council of Guam Central Office does not have seven vehicles. Uh, we may have a hundred and some vehicles, but 
probably 25% of those don't work. We're just using it for parts. And that's why we're asking. We don't want any new vehicles. We haven't had any since 2015. We're only asking for the government of Guam. GPA purchases a lot of new vehicles every year, all these autonomous agencies. All we're asking is, can we put in statute that they be, they give MCOG first choice of obtaining the vehicles. I don't know where they're sending it to, uh, maybe to the other islands or to anywhere, but, but that's all. But I, I'm telling you, there is accountability as far as gas usage and mileage is concerned, because they're well, all Okay, we'll, we'll work out many of the issues you have with your oversight chair. Yeah. So they can be addressed appropriately. You know, by the oversight, Senator Talai would be the one to introduce whatever bill that's going to help the mayors. I, I'll, I'll support the mayors. I've always supported the mayors. I just thank you, make Barry. Sure thank you, Barry, for supporting right. our budget. Thank you. Okay. Um, there being no other, there's no one else to testify, Mr. Mead. You're okay. You, you, good testimony, okay? There being none, the committee will conclude the budget hearing. I know you'll be back. The committee will conclude the budget hearing for the mayor's council. The committee will continue to receive testimonies for the, and please address your written testimony to the Committee on General Government Operation, Appropriation, and Housing and submit it via email, Senator Joe S. Nogstein at gmail.com. And Sidhu's Masi for your attendance and participating in today's hearing. And for those at home, thank you for watching. This budget hearing is now adjourned at 11.09. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.